And they said, well, we, we don't really have one, you know. They're a very kind of trusting organization. They say, it, it's a very sort of, they're, they're very sort of trusting and very sort of internationalist, right? They say, right, it's, it's got an ethic, this organization. And it goes like this. It says, everybody, everyone anywhere in the world who's done a randomized trial, you're welcome, you know. We will gather you in, however big or however small your trial, we want to know about it. And when I was first involved with the Cochrane Collaboration, I used to search journals by hand, looking for trials that they hadn't in included in their registers. You know, I used to search the Croatian Journal of Surgery and find out, oh, there's a randomized trial, tell the Cochrane Collaboration about it, put it on the Cochrane uh, Register of Trials. But now I'm, I feel, ah, oh, I was so naive, you know. I, I was so naive to think that this is a, a good... So they have no policy on fraud, which means they ignore it, right? They just take everything on trust. They trust everybody. Um, and then they say, well, we use rigorous... We use grade to assess the quality of the evidence. Now... You can assess the quality of, a, of the... You can take the manuscript and you can assess the quality of the evidence, but, you, but you're only assessing quality if en everything that's written down in that manuscript is true, you know, and we take that on trust. So I, I, I sort of stopped believing, you know. I said, well, you just trust everybody, you know, um, and, and I didn't believe it, and so I... We published something in the, in the British Medical Journal. We, we said you know, the knowledge system that healthcare is based on is just not fit. It, it doesn't work, you know. People saying these systematic reviews provide the best evidence and that's what we should base our healthcare on. You know, systematic reviews of randomized trials, those are the best evidence. That's what should guide treatment decisions. Doctors need to look at systematic reviews and then treat the patient. I just, I just didn't believe it. So you could see, you could see now the process of not of falling out of love with the Cochrane Collaboration. So, um, and of course, the Cochrane Collaboration really didn't like this at all. You know, the editor in chief wrote a letter complaining about me and this and that and the other. So our little part of the Cochrane Collaboration said, because I'm I'm the editor of the Cochrane Injuries Group, and I said, right. I don't care if the Cochrane Collaboration as a whole is not going to change. We're going to change what we do. And we're going to do two things. We're only going to include prospectively registered trials. Right? We're only going to include prospectively registered trials. And when we, and when we include those trials, we're going to check that the data are real. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do that. And so, you know, what we, what we jet often do is we ask to say, can you send me evidence of ethics committee approval and can you send me the data set so that we can check it? Um, that, that's very interesting. When you ask for the data, when you ask for the data from these randomized trials, you realize that the world is a very dangerous place because you get letters back. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't send you the data. It was in my hospital and it burnt down. I'm sorry I can't send you the data, it was in my basement and there was a flood, you know. I'm sorry I can't send you the data, it was in the computer in the back seat of my car when I crashed. And you thought, wow, it's a really dangerous world. <laughs> you know, something's really happening out there, you know. And then you think, mm, do I believe this? <laughs> But, you know, there were floods and thefts and fires and, you know, and like ants, ants at the man, ants, you know, termites at the data. It's very, very suspicious. So, um, so we decided, like, we decided, look, this big idea of the Cochrane Collaboration to include all trials, you can't check everything 
because it takes too much time. So we decided that the best thing to do would be to throw away the small trials. Right? Throw away the small trials because they're not worth the time. Right? You've got a, you've got a randomized trial with 50 patients, 25 in the treatment group, 25 in the control group. It's just not information. So just throw it away. Right? Um, and so, and focus, focus your efforts on the big trials. And if there are any big trials, then you just say, we don't know. So focus efforts on the big trials. So now in, in the meta-analysis I do it, we, with, with my team, we say, right, we will include, we write it in the protocol, we will include trials with more than 1,000 patients. And that saves you a lot of time because you don't have to deal with all of the small, small rubbish. That, a lot of it isn't true. And actually, the time you have to spend finding out if it is true isn't worth it. You know, you, you could spend, a, you spend as much time checking the data for a big trial as a small trial, but the small trial gives you very little information. So it's, it's not worth the time. And then we focus on prospectively registered trials. Now, everybody knows that trials need to be prospectively registered. But why do we re reg prospectively register them? What do you think? Why do we register randomized trials before we, ran we enroll the first patient? It's a ethical like, policy, right? Before you do your trial, you need to register. You need to make sure that it's safe. It is a policy, a policy. And, and, the and the journal editors insist that it was registered. They won't publish the trial unless it was registered. But, but why do we do this? Because of the, the providing the evidence. So that there's an evidence. When the editor asks for any kind of evidence, they can have that registered evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you need to have evidence that it's prospectively registered. But what's the advantage? What, what, what do we gain from registering trials? Integrity. Yes, I, 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 think, I, I think that's right. So if you, the idea is that if you, when you start a trial, you don't know what the results are going to turn out to be, right? And so if at the start of a trial, before you know what the results are, you say what outcome data you're going to collect and... Um, then it's clear that you collected these outcomes and if you only publish some of those outcomes that we'll know that you, only, you didn't publish them all. Yeah? So f first of all, it gives you a cohort of prospectively registered trials so that you can look back and say, right, Say you have 100 trials registered and you have 50 trials in the literature. You can look back and say, well, where are the results of the 50 trials that, I, that weren't published? Yeah? So it allows you to have an inception cohort, a cohort, right? All right, there, there are 100 trials in the start. And then some trials never get started, some trials start. Uh, they don't recruit as well as possible. They, they, you know, some trials get to the end. The, the authors look at the results. They think, well, that's not very interesting. We're not going to publish that. But if you know there were 100 trials to start with, you can go back and find them, right? So it gives you the possibility of finding the total population of trials before there was this selection from the results. 
by the results. I mean, it also does what you said. It stops data-dependent analyses because you should write the, the statistical analysis plan as well. Yeah? So, I mean, it was, it was first suggested by a guy called Symes in 1986. And he did a, he did a, a meta-analysis of published trials and he found that the treatment looked beneficial and, he f and then he did a meta-analysis of all the prospectively registered trials and got a different result. So he said, right, we should be doing, we, you know, we should, if we want to include all of the evidence without this selection bias, we need prospective registration. And then we can see, well, look, how many trials started? Let's get the results from them all. Yeah, that's the idea. And it's like, it's like we don't do systematic reviews on the winners. This is what happens at the moment. You know, if winning is being published, we only do systematic reviews on the winners. Whereas we should be doing systematic reviews on the starters. Yeah? We should know who was at the start. These are, the, these are prospectively registered trials. These are at the start of the trial. And a trial is like a marathon. You might not get to the end, right? Only some get published and at the end. They're the winners, right? If you only look at winners, you don't get the truth. You've got to look at all of the, all of the evidence. And then you can do what the, 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 the gentleman at the back says. You can, you can compare what they said they would do with what they actually reported and see if there's any difference. 